In this video, I'm going to show you the Excel skills for section 4.2, which is the section on binomial distributions. And the biggest thing with this section is to always be looking to see which problems satisfy a binomial distribution. On the test or on your final exam, the problem's not going to say, this is binomial. You've got to be able to read through it and recognize, oh, these are the four conditions that makes it binomial. So just to recap the four conditions, the first one is that there's a fixed number of independent trials. So you've got to have a set number of things that you're doing to start the problem. And then for each scenario, something's either a success or it's a failure. So there's only two possibilities. Then the probability of success must be exactly the same for all the problems, which is almost a given because their first scenario required them to be independent trials, which tells us that the first trial doesn't affect later trials. So the probability shouldn't be changing, but it's so important that we've got to make sure that we have the probability of success always the same. And then the fourth condition is that we're interested in the number of successes that happen in the trials. So always be looking for those four things, put them on your note card, and inspect every problem. Is this binomial? To make sure that you don't try to do something else when the problem is a binomial problem. So here we have a scenario. It says, a test consists of 10 true or false questions. If the student guesses on each question, what is the probability that the student will get exactly eight questions correct? So let's see, is this binomial? Do we have a fixed number of independent trials? Well, we have 10 questions, and I think it's safe to assume that each question is a separate question, especially with true false. They're all standalone where it gives you the statement and you've got to decide you know, yes or no. So we have a fixed number of independent trials. In this case, we have 10 trials. Then we've got to decide, is there a success and a failure? Well, a success is that somebody gets the question correct. A failure is that they get it wrong. And for a true false test, those are the only two options. You're either right or you're wrong. So there we have our second condition. Then we need to know what's the probability of success. Well, it's not explicitly stated, but we can figure it out. We have two possibilities, true or false. One of them's right, one of them's wrong. So I think it's safe to assume that the probability of success is 0.5 and the probability of failure is 0.5. There's only two options and only one of them is correct, so you have a one in two chance. So a 50-50 chance of a success and a 50-50 chance of failure. And then we need to be interested in the number of successes. And in this case, we're looking for the probability that eight are correct. So we are. So this is good. This is a binomial. So now we're ready to actually answer the question. It says, what is the probability the student will get exactly eight correct? So we're trying to find the probability our number of successes is exactly equal to eight. So I'm going to go up to my function wizard and Computer's a little slow today. Uh, change that to statistical. Everything in this class is under statistical. And then we're going to go down to the binome dist function. And what I like about binome dist is it basically tells you what to put in the boxes. So the first one, return the number of successes in the trial. Well, we're looking for exactly eight successes. The number of independent trials, we said that was 10. And it's the probability of success. We said that was 0.5. And then for cumulative, I always put false. And just to make sure um, we're all on the same page, there's a couple different ways you can do this binomial function. In your lab book, at the end of unit two, it lists out like nine different ways. And in my opinion, um, just the way my brain works, I would rather learn one method that works for all problems rather than trying to memorize nine different subsets and um, try to remember which way goes with what problem. So I do not do binomial the way the lab book does it. If you like the lab book's method, that's awesome. It is correct. You will get full credit if you do it with those nine different scenarios in the lab book. If that makes sense to your brain, please do it that way. Uh, just know that in this video, I'm always going to use false for cumulative, which tells you to do each one each probability as a separate trial. Um, if you put true, that means it's going to be adding up a bunch of different ones together. And I think the binomial functions, it's a little finicky in how it adds stuff up and it, I think it makes it worse. So again, I always put faults for cumulative and I'll show you my examples how I do it. If you like doing it my way, that's great. If you like doing it the lab book way, that's great also. Uh, just know that there are different ways you can get to the same correct answer. So you can always put faults for binomial because I want it to calculate just one single value all the time. So this will tell us the probability we have exactly eight 
correct answers if you're guessing, which is 0 0.0439. So basically a 4% chance. So if you go into a multiple choice test with 10 questions and you guess, there's a 4% chance you're going to get exactly eight questions correct. That's pretty slim to get an 80, but you know, maybe you're a good guesser. Who knows? So next part, same basic question, but a little bit different. Let's see, a test consists of 10 true or false questions. To pass the test, the student must answer at least eight questions correctly. If the student guesses on each question, what is the probability that the student will pass the test? All right, so this one it's saying at least eight. So that means eight or more. So I'll show you how I find binomials that require multiple things together. So we're actually gonna create our probability distribution. And we did this back in 4.1, where we list out all possible values of x, and then the probability that each one occurs. So we've gotta ask ourselves, what's the fewest number of questions a student could get correct? And that is actually zero. And please be careful, binomial distributions should always start with zero, but that's the number one forgotten number I see. Students wanna start with one. Well, hopefully you'd get at least one correct, but you could get zero. So our possible values for x is you could get zero questions correct, or you could get all the way up to 10 questions correct. So I'm gonna list those out separately. And then to find our probabilities, I'm gonna go back up to Function Wizard and go down to Binome Dist. And we're gonna use some cell references to make this easy. This time our number of successes, I'm going to cell reference the zero, and that way I'll be able to drag down and fill in the rest of the chart. For this scenario, we always have 10 trials, so I'm gonna type in the 10. The probability of success is 0.5 because you've got a 50-50 chance of guessing it correctly. And then again, I always put false for cumulative. I want it to find each of these separate values. And then I'm going to drag that down. And let's just check to make sure this is a valid probability distribution. All of our P of X's are between 0 and 1. And if we sum our P of X's, they should sum to 1, and they do. So this is a valid probability distribution. So now to actually answer the question, it says, what is the probability a student answers at least eight questions correctly? So this time, we're trying to find the probability we have greater than or equal to eight questions. So that means we either have eight, we have nine, or we have 10. At least eight means we get eight correct, or we get nine correct, or we get 10 correct. And if you notice, I put that or in there. Or is a key word for the addition rule. So to find the probability that we have at least eight correct, that means eight or nine or 10, what we want to do is sum those probabilities. So I'm going to sum the probabilities for eight or nine or 10, and that gives me the overall probability a student can pass this test purely by guessing, which is a little over 5%. So it's a very, very slim chance you will pass this test by guessing with no prior knowledge. And so whenever I do binomials, I always, Again, I always use faults, and if I need to do at least eight and do add up things for eight or more, I just sum them manually. Or if I wanted to do, um, this wasn't the question, but if I wanted to do the probability that x was, I don't know, less than three, I would sum zero, one, and two, because less than three means it's below it, so it would be just zero, one, and two. So whenever I'm doing probabilities that involve multiple things together, I always manually add them, again, because I think that binomial dysfunction, if you start putting trues in for the cumulative, gets a little glitchy. But it's in your lab book. If you want to do it the other way, you're welcome to. Again, I don't care how you do the Excel. As long as you can get to a correct answer, that makes me happy. And if you have questions, please post on Blackboard or send me an email. All right, one more part for binomial. A test consists of 10 true or false questions. If the student guesses on each question, what is the mean and standard deviation for the number of correct answers? All right, so if you think back to 4.1, when we found the mean, we actually had to do x times p of x and then add them together. And the standard deviation, we had to do x minus mu squared times p of x, add them, and then square root them. It, was, it wasn't hard, but it was a little bit of clicking. It's a whole lot easier for binomial. The mean, which is mu, is just n times p. So n is the number of trials p is the probability of success, which is 0.5. So the average number of correctly guessed questions is going to be 5, which makes sense. If you get a 50-50 chance, you would expect to get about half right. Then our sigma, which is our standard deviation, is the square root of n times p times q. So p is the probability of success, which was 50%. The probability of failure was also 50% for this problem. So to find our standard deviation, it's the square root of n times p times q. 
for 1.5811. So it's a lot easier to find our mean and standard deviation with binomial than it is for just a generic discrete probability distribution.